It is wonderful to have you this morning, the day of the Lord. We are excited of what the Lord is doing in our midst, uh, especially that concerns His Word. Continually we hear testimonies upon testimonies of God's faithfulness and what He's doing in us through His Word. So, it is wonderful to see all these things happening, people getting born again, people rededicating their lives to Jesus. It is wonderful. It is amazing. If it's your first time visiting us, we go through the Bible here at Calvary and we began the book of Acts. We go through the book of Acts in the um, Sunday services and then we go through the Old Testament in our midweek services. We, are, we just began 2 Samuel last Thursday. So if you would join us, it will be a blessing to see all of us. We have come to chapter 5 of Acts. We begin from verses 11 to 32, I believe, and the Lord will bless us all. So let us bow our heads and pray before we read God's Word. God, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege you have given to us as your children, as your people, to receive your Word from your command that we are supposed to read it publicly, Lord. That in, in, in itself is powerful to just read it. But also we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to us this morning as we talk about this event that happened thousands of years ago and still relevant to us, still alive with us today because your word is powerful. So as we speak of it, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be present in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we saw a very terrifying event of... Um, a man and a woman who were married, Ananias and Sapphira, because of the condition of their hearts, because of what they conceived in their hearts, they were struck dead, not with the apostle, but with God himself, because we see from the scripture that God does not entertain sin. He does not love it, and we went through other scriptures, even in the Old Testament, at the beginning of a season in life, God would not condone some things to happen. And we see that playing in this chapter, chapter 5, that there was kindness before the end of chapter 4. We see men and women selling their properties selling their land, selling their houses, and they brought all this money before the feet of the apostle so that it will be distributed evenly as people had need. And when that was happening, you know, the, 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 the enemy tries to capitalize on these things. He knows that we hold these resources dear to our hearts especially money, our houses, our land, all these things. They're so dear to us, and the enemy knows. He tried to stop the church using the religious leaders. It was not possible. And now the first time Satan is mentioned in the New Testament, he's lying to people, he's lying to Ananias and Sapphira, and they conceived this lie, and you know what? It yielded to death. Every sin that we commit, it will yield to death. It either will be spiritual death or physical death. Either way, it will kill us. Let us be warned. And this probably happened because he saw this man called Joseph, or Joseph whose name was changed to um, Barnabas, a Levite, he sold his land, the Bible says, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold their 
possession, and they kept back part of it. You know, when Peter was speaking to them, he said, Did, were you guys aware that this land belonged to you? And even after you have sold it, did you have all the rights to do whatever you want to do with your money? It is yours. No one instructed you to go sell it and bring it to church. You did it at your own volition. But because maybe he saw that um, Barnabas was doing great works in the kingdom of God and encouraging people, and perhaps he had some goodwill with the apostles. So he thought maybe the way to get closer to the leadership is by bringing my money before their feet. And that will probably entice them. And do you know what? That kind of an idea still is present with us until today. That people will think, you know, if I want to win their hearts, let me bring this to church. Let me take this to this home. Let me do this. Let me do this. Perhaps I will win their hearts. Be assured that whatever you do, God knows it ahead of time. He knows your motives. He knows the reason why you want to give that money. You want to give that land. Check your motives. He wanted to appeal to the leadership that he's also doing great things. He's selling land and bringing. And Peter said to, to him, why have you conceived in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You're not lying to us. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. And this sin landed him in death, him and his wife. And the Bible says there in verses 11, So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done amongst the people. And they were with, all, with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest, whether the, 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 the people born again and all the religious people hanging around them, none of them did join them. But the people esteemed them highly. The people esteemed them highly. Today, a few things that we are going to mention that are actually the marks of obedient Christians. We're going to point out a few of them, marks of um, true Christian, true obeying Christian who will obey the voice of God. We see here in this portion of the scripture that these people continually, they met at the Solomon's porch, this place was not new to them. Jesus Christ also went at the Solomon's porch at some time back and, you know, he was teaching people the Bible, the Old Testament. And this was their very regular place. They, they, they didn't have a home, they didn't have a church that would hold, you know, the 3,000 and the 5,000 and the people were being added to the church daily. But they met at the temple daily. And you remember last week we saw that they were told not to speak in the name of Jesus one more time. You say, we're going to let you go, but don't speak in this name one more time. One aspect that we are seeing as this church is growing is that there was purity in the church. And this was first made known to the church of what God did with Ananias and Sapphira. That any, for the church to grow, for the church to be powerful, sin had to be piled out. And we asked ourselves last week, if God was to drop dead people today, how many would stand? 
but he hasn't. So people have taken advantage of the grace of God. Integrity has to be the core of a true church. In every aspect, integrity has to reign. Are we pure? You know what God says? Be ye holy for I am holy. And as I've said before, it is not a suggestion. It is a command from God. He wants us to walk holy before him. He's provided ways and means for us to do so. We see that as they met together, many signs and wonders were done through them. And these signs and wonders, they are happening, a lot of them, to affirm the word of God. They didn't have the New Testament as we have it today to see the history of how the church began and how God walked through them. God is still walking through the church today, but not the way it happened this time in the early church. He still heals people. He still saves people. He still brings the dead to life as he wishes he's, because he's God. But we see some events, they happened to let the world know that this has been rubber stamped by God himself. These men are not walking through their own power, through their own abilities. They are relying in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, Acts 1.8, that you will receive power when the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the world. So the bigger question that we have with this portion of Scripture that we're going to study today, are we willing to obey God no matter the cost? Are we willing to obey God? And as I was studying this and reading uh, books about, you know, the, the attribute of God that is holiness and righteousness, what I saw was that a holy life is a great instrument in the hands of God. A holy life is a great instrument in the hands of God. That is why he wants us to be holy, so that he will use us mightily today. We barely see God's power at work. People are not getting born again. Lives are not transformed because of how we conduct ourselves. Many people in the world today have a form of godliness, yet denying the power of God. We are not walking in unity. There is no oneness of purpose. Holiness is not what we see in people's lives. In fact, many other people will say, I can't go to that church. I can't go to that church. Why? Because I know so and so and so and so and I know their lives. We are ashamed to the community, and we are bringing shame to the cross of Jesus Christ because of our lives. We cannot hide it to God. We can try to, you know, be, be, look better on Sunday morning or on a Thursday or a Wednesday, whatever time we have for meetings. We, we put on our best. But when we are alone, he knows our best. <laughs> he knows who we are. We cannot hide it from him. David says, where can I hide from you? <laughs> where can I hide? There's no place. Let us try as much as we are able not to bring shame to the gospel of Jesus Christ through our lives. It would be very sad for me to hear someone say that I, I won't go to church because I know your life. 
I mean, if there are allegations, God knows. But if you know that they're true, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Paul says, we ought to walk with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. You see, this man, the Bible says, that people esteem them highly. Whatever they saw in the apostles, they never saw in these religious leaders. Yet there were the people who were supposed to instruct people to know God, to teach people to know God. Yet they failed. Their lives were not in line with what they taught the people. In fact, some of them, like the Sadducees, never believed in the resurrection, but they were part of the leadership of that time. Obedient Christians have a fear of the Lord's holiness. If you look at the Lord's holiness, Via who you are, you will desire to go to him more and more. The, more. the more you come closer to God, the more you realize how you're unholy, how unworthy you are. And you need him every day. You need him every hour. We can't work it out with our own strength. Every Christian, every obedient Christian, have a fear of the Lord's holiness. If we know that, we know that he hates pride. He hates a lying tongue. He hates those people who take advantage of their neighbors. He hates those who steal things. He hates sin generally. That is why it is God himself who did the first disciplinary act in the early church. And then after, he handed that authority to the church leadership. Fear came upon all people because of what they saw happening. You cannot lie to God and just go. And the people esteemed them highly. You know, nowadays it's, 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 it's very casual. And of course, we are not supposed to worship people. We are not supposed to revere people that much. But also the Bible tells us to give respect to whom it deals. Honor people who have deserved it. Respect people who have earned that respect. This man, they did earn it. People esteemed them highly. And the believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. This is also against the culture of this man. In fact, in the temple, outside the courts was a specific place. It was called the, 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 the court of the women. It was outside. They had no respect for women. And yet now what is beginning to happen, that there is inclusion of everyone. Men and women, they are getting born again. They are getting uh, into the family of Christ. And all of them are serving Jesus equally. It's not discriminating anyone. In this context, everyone. Both men and women. So that they brought the sick out in the streets and lay them on beds and couches. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. This was... 
you know, the, the previous belief, even uh, maybe, you know, they, they're getting born again and many are giving their lives to Jesus Christ, but this is what they believed before, that if there was a man or a woman who was great in power, whether good or bad, if they would walk down the street and their shadows touches any one of you, either good things will happen or bad things will happen. Very superstitious. And my African friends, you can concur. <laughs> you know these things. You know, someone's like, no, don't stand. Your shadow will cause me to do this. Petitia shadow ya koko. Go round. You know, go, go round there. I don't want your shadow to come closer to me. We, we don't know actually what they mean, but we just repeat them because we found them. We don't know what they mean. We just believe them. And some, of, some people believe them so hard <laughs> that when they sit down, they don't allow your shadow to come. They'd rather stand. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> they believe that. That is why the, the, they brought a lot of people because they know Peter and the rest of the apostles, they will be on their way to the temple and this is where they will go through so people will be healed, perhaps. But the Bible tells us here that so also a multitude gathered from the surrounding, surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All of them were healed whether they lay hands on them, whether they just spoke, or whether, you know, in the moment the, the Holy Spirit was present and these people were healed, whatever happened, they were healed, all of them. That means a lot of miracles happened. And this also was to confirm the authenticity of God's Word, the Word that this uh, man spoke. And you realize that every time they begin to speak, they'll speak or they'll witness about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was at the core. So any church, for any church or any individual to, you know, um, be used powerfully by God, holiness has to be the core thing. Integrity has to be the core thing of a true church. A church that doesn't deal with sin will be flooded by hypocrites. If you don't deal with sin, the child will be flooded by people who have covered themselves. They're not real. You remember our gorilla story? <laughs> the man who clothed himself with a gorilla suit, stepped into the, the, the lion's territory, and he was afraid and trying to convince the lion not to kill him. He was kind of shouting, and the lion told him, Shut up or we're all going to lose our jobs. Because all of them were pretending they clothed themselves with clothes that would tell people that they're this, yet they are not. Many people were healed. God had taken out the, the impure out of the church. And you know, when, when the church deals with sin, people will join the church who wants their sin dealt with. If you deal with sin, people will come. Because I got my own problem. I got issues, bro. I got a lot of things that I want to bring to the Lord. I can't deal with them alone. 
I need Jesus Christ. For those who will accept to follow Jesus and to obey him, God will help them deal with their sins. Not hiding them so that people think, you know, they're, they're just good. They're well. They are awesome, wonderful people. When the church deals with sin, people will join the church who wants their sin dealt with. And that was the model of the early church. Even when Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, telling them how you know, they've stooped so low and letting a man live with his father's wife and they're saying nothing about it in the church. Excommunicate such people. Take them out to the world so that perhaps if they have good conscience, they'll think about losing the wonderful fellowship and they'll repent and come back. That is the reason why they'll be delivered to the enemy, to the devil, to Satan. These believers, they were increasingly added to the Lord, men and women. And this multitude gathered and they brought people and they were all healed. And all this word spread out Jerusalem and to the nearby towns and cities. And these leaders and the high priest got mad. Verse 17, the Bible tells us, that when the high priest rose up and all who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, the people who never believed in the resurrection, and they were filled with indignation, with rage, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a common prison where they would take everyone before they would give a judgment whether they deserve to be in there for life or to be taken out for whatever reason. They are in a common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison door and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. This is a wonderful command that God sent the angel to deliver to the apostles. Go to the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The words of eternal life. The words that bring salvation to mankind. This is what you ought to do. The instruction is very clear. And when they heard, when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders and the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the door. But when we entered them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome was would be. They wondered, what happened? Did, did we not lock them securely in the common prison? We left them there yesterday. It is just an overnight. None of them is in there. So one came and told them, saying, look, the man whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Which means these people are very obedient. They are following instruction. 
They were told, go out in the temple and do what? Teach the people all the words of this life. And this is what they are doing right there. Look, the men are standing in the temple teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. They actually beseeched them. <laughs> they asked them politely. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, can we um, arrest you? <laughs> can we arrest you? I mean, you, you, you wouldn't have a lot of power to resist. Like, hey, we, there's a problem. Can we, can we go down here and talk about it a little bit? Oh, man, that is not what we see around. <laughs> we get people on the street who are trying to, you know, earn a life and selling produce on the street. The way these people are hurt us on the street, it's not nice. No one will just come and talk to you nicely. Whether they're police, whether they're county officers, it's like when you get to that office, automatically learn to be, learn not to be kind. <laughs> learn not to be gentle with your fellow human beings. But we see the reason why they were gentle with them is they feared the multitude. They feared that these people would stone them to death. That means the apostles had gained a lot of influence right now in the lives of these people. They brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked, this is what he said. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled or you have flooded Jerusalem with your doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. You know, these people, they forget so quickly. I don't know if you guys remember when Jesus was taken before Pontius Pilate and all these other leaders, and they had no reason to crucify him, yet these other sect leaders cried out to crucify him. In fact, they said, we are not afraid of his blood being brought to our lives. All we want to see is this man dead. Let his blood be upon us. And right now, what are they saying? <laughs> you intend to bring this man's blood on us? It's like something is not working well with them. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, this is not just the two, John and Peter. This is the twelve. We ought... Actually, the other translation says, we must obey God. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. In other words, he's saying, you guys are not walking with the Lord. You guys are not obeying the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because we're trying to stop what the Holy Spirit is doing. You're the high priest. You're supposed to know this better. And how do we know all these things, all this dialogue? Because Saul of Tarsus was in there. This time he was not born again. He's the one who gave this testimony to Dr. Luke. 
and he's writing to remind us of this thing. So we see number one, holiness has to be in place in the life of a believer or in the life of a church that is powerful. We see that God caused these miracles to validate the authenticity of his word through the apostles. A true church must commit to divine authority, to God's power, not our own power, not our own programs, not our own craftiness, but we got to submit ourselves to the divine authority. That is why they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. In other words, they're saying, we ain't going to obey you. If that is what you guys were looking for, don't think about it. And how do you think this, the high priest and the rest are taking this information? They are the most powerful people in the world. And you're telling them, we are not going to respect you. We are not going to honor you. In other words, this is what we would call civil disobedience. If whatever the government is saying is, is making sense, we're going to do it. If it's not, we are going to disregard it. What happened if they did say, well, for this one time, we are going to obey you. <laughs> do you think the church would have had the power that we see? Probably not. There was no compromise. As a believer, as an individual, do not compromise for anything. Whether it's a promotion for a job, because everyone is looking for a promotion every time. Looking for a promotion. Why don't you just do this? Whatever place you're employed, be faithful and do your job. And see what God can do in your life. He doesn't have to add you a lot of money. But just watch what the Lord will do in your life. If you're obedient. A true church must commit itself to the authority of God. Obedient Christians. We know the Lord's power. Through who? Through the Holy Spirit. When His power comes upon us, we know that He came and He lives in us and He is at work with us. The early church experienced the Lord's power through the many miracles performed by the apostles and through powerful witness and resulting powers was seen throughout the life of sinners who were converted. If you try to put the numbers, you know, the number of people who were healed and the people who got born again, the people who got born again were so many. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Meaning God's word was at work. And we also see that there is a bit of persecution that is now coming into them. We shall read it probably next week. You know, after these people have been summoned, they'll be let go. But you know, before that, what will happen? They'll beat them. <laughs> they'll scourge them severely. And when they were walking out after all this coaching, they said they counted it worthy that they suffered for the sake of Jesus Christ. As a believer, are you willing to suffer for him? Are you willing to go through diverse temptations and trials for his name's sake. Perhaps many of us will not be taken to jail. But you know what is with us daily? It's the great animosity we see. 
You speak the truth and people instantly hate on you. They hate you for telling them the truth. Truth hits differently. You speak it, people try to run away because they know it's power. And you know what we've always tried to do every week here? We, we never try to defend God's word. You know what you do? Like our friend uh, Spurgeon says, you let the lion out, you don't need to say a word. It will defend itself. The lion will defend itself. Just let it out of the cage, it will defend itself. Speak the word of God and let it be. The Holy Spirit will walk in His word. Because He's looking to His word to accomplish it. You know the commandment that He gave to these disciples? Go speak to the people the words of this life. And when they were brought before these leaders, they were not trying to you know, be theologically correct. They're just telling them, we, we ain't going to obey you, and we are going to speak in the name of Jesus whom you murdered, whom God raised from the dead, and he sits on the throne. And actually, you know what he does? He's waiting for you guys to repent, and he'll forgive your sins. And these were the group of people who thought they were righteous. <laughs> it hits differently. Maybe we won't go in there, but there will be the presence of great animosity as we are serving the Lord. The world has not the ability to stand against the church that relies upon divine power. Jesus said it, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Obedient Christians obey God over and above civil authorities. We, we obey God above. Sadly enough, many churches, and it's from the pulpit trickling down, we have obeyed the government above God. And you know, the more you do that, the more the world and these world leaders are taking control over the church because we handed it to them. Let me read us these verses so we'll come to them next week. Verses 41. So they departed. This is after they were released. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching in the name of Christ. I mean, what kind of people are we dealing with right here? Well, they, they were taken in, in, in jail, and then the angel of the Lord came, opened the gates for them. I wonder what they were thinking when they were walking out. <laughs> Seeing the guards right like that. <laughs> Can you see me? <laughs> Can you see us? We're walking out. We are free. We have freedom. And these guards may be in different shapes. They're right there. They're guarding these people. They were doing some vain jobs that night. 
the people you're trying to protect, they're out of there. They're protected by another kingdom. And they're out. And these high priests and these leaders, they're wondering, what kind of people are these? What kind of powers are these? But now they, they were in there, they are out. And then we bring them in, and then we let them go for whatever reason. We scourge them thoroughly, and they go rejoicing. What kind of people are these? <laughs> they, they, they couldn't even compare this beating with what was done to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they counted this shame worthy. They counted it a worthy cause. And you know what they did? They did not run away from the vicinity of these people. They went back where? To the temple daily. They didn't run away. This kind of obedience, I desire it in my life. I, I want to walk with the Lord daily. I want to do what He says to me. I, I want to be holy. I want to be righteous, not my own righteousness, but that which has been imputed to me through the blood of Jesus Christ. In me dwells no good thing apart from that which we receive from the Lord. You say daily in the temple, and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching. They taught and instruct the flock, and they preached, proclaiming the good news, and most often to the people who were lost, so that they will rethink their lives. Counted worthy for suffering. As I bring the worship team to come, you know, think about it. That obedient Christians boldly and persistently will proclaim the message of Christ no matter the cost. No matter what it costs. Let me ask us this question, all of us, including myself. Has the gospel of Jesus Christ costed us anything. Has it? This proclamation of the gospel involves confronting sinners with their sins. We don't like confrontations. We don't like it. We smell it from a distance. We run away from it. It involves. This proclamation involves exalting Jesus Christ above every other. Peter exalted Jesus by proclaiming that he has the power to give them forgiveness of their sins, these religious leaders. He told them. This proclamation involves offering repentance and forgiveness to the worst and worst of sinners. We can't sit there and assume we are better than the people we see out there. Some of us were worse than them. And some people have clothed themselves and they become the worst more than the heathens out there. A clothed wolf is more dangerous than a goat outside there. At least those are the things we see from the scripture. They're not my words. So don't punish me. <laughs> it's God's word. Are we going to obey God's word or obey other people? You choose one of what you want to do. This, the, before they had said, you think we want to obey men rather than God? 
We don't go that path. And repeatedly when they are brought, these are the things they say over and over. We will obey God rather than men. We'll obey God rather than men. We'll obey God rather than men. And this is my prayer for every one of us, that we'll obey God in every aspect of our lives. Every aspect. It doesn't matter what it is. Obey God. Run away from your sin because sin yields death. And every sin is punishable. Trust me. He will punish sins. But now that we have an opportunity to return to him, let us not take advantage of his grace. Paul says, should we sin so that his grace will abound? He says, certainly not. We cannot take him back to the cross again. He died once and for all. And when he will return, he's coming back to take the church. Those who will say like Paul, I have fought a good fight of faith. I have run the race. And you know what Jesus will say to those kind of people, men and women? Welcome, good and faithful servant. I pray that those will be the words of my Lord when he finally returns, when I finally meet him. This proclamation must be bold and persistent. This proclamation meets with varying responses. Some are receiving, some are getting healed, and some are totally rejecting it. Same word. Isn't it amazing that we read the same word, but the way it comes to you people, it's different. They say when you're standing here preaching, one sermon that you prepared, and you have 500 folks, you just preach 500 sermons. Because <laughs> you go back home, Ask people what they received on a Sunday morning service. You'll be amazed. Like, did I really say that? <laughs> because God works in us miraculously, the way he knows best. Let us walk in holiness. The Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. You will only have this boldness if you know whom you trust. You obey Christ or you're going to obey the rulers of the world. It is your choice. You make a choice what you're going to do. Father God, we thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. Right straight to our hearts. And we pray this morning that you would help us grasp the truth of your word. Many a times our articulation cannot even bring it home better than what you can do to us when we are listening to you, when we are reading your word, how I pray, O oh God, that you bring clarity to our minds and hearts as we continue to think about your word, as we continue to meditate upon it. I pray if there is anyone amongst us who is struggling with any sort of sin, I pray that your Holy Spirit will call on them this morning that they will turn away from their sins. Those who walked with you before and they ran away, I pray that you draw them back through your word that is powerful, O oh God. You alone can do that. We pray for those who are sick in their bodies that, Lord, you'd heal them. Stretch forth your hand, O oh God. You know them. You know their pain. 
you know, whatever things they're going through. I pray, your God, that you'll be merciful to every one of us. And I know that every one of us needs you. So, Lord, I pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit every day, every hour, every minute. Thank you, God. And as we give our offerings, as we give our finances to you, I pray that we'll give a percentage that brings glory to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.